today we're going to be in for a treat. Something you don't see very often on cable news these days, which I hope to provide you with my two excellent guests, two of my fellow contributors at National Review. I am a senior writer at National Review. They are my colleagues at National Review, and we are going to host a debate, an actual debate, where people actually <laughs> disagree with each other, collegially, civilly, but forcefully. I'd like to welcome my guests today, two of my colleagues at National Review, senior writer, Michael Brendan Doherty. Hello, Michael. Hello, glad to be here. Thank you for joining us. And the, I need to get this right, it's complicated. The Thomas Rhodes Journalism Fellow at National Review Institute and the host of the new podcast, E-Conception, E-Conception, E-Conception. E-Conception is how we're yeah. <laughs> with A-I-E-R, Dominic Pino. Dominic, thank you so much. Thanks, Noah. So the topic today, you see the wall behind me, it's none of that. It's going to be that. We're talking about Ukraine. We're talking about national security policy. And we're talking about the supplemental package that the Senate passed this week, which is before the House, but has stalled in the House. And the central proposition is, is this in America's interest? A little bit of background for you. Senate passed a supplemental package uh, designed to fund America's conflicts abroad and bundled into that package uh, funding for and changes to statute around immigration and the border. All of this within the, the rubric of national security. Joe Biden asked Congress to make to package this, and Republicans seemingly were willing to play along. When the bipartisan deal was rolled out, however, it was not uh, did not meet the liking of House Republicans. Senate Republicans agreed. The border funding, the border statute changes were stripped. So all we're left with is national security policy funding for America's conflicts abroad. Primarily Ukraine, about $61 billion in there for Ukraine, although much of that money is spent at home replenishing our ordinance and sending it over there. Taiwan funding, Israel funding, stripping UNRWA, the United Nations uh, refugee organization that operates in Gaza, which has been alleged uh, credibly to have uh, worked with Hamas and some various other priorities in there. So we've got a bundle of funds for America's wars abroad and America's conflicts abroad from our partners and our allies. And it's stalled in the House. Uh, Speaker Mike Johnson doesn't really want to bring it up, doesn't seem like he's interested in moving on that, even though there's a fair amount of support in the House. But among Republicans, it's a little bit shakier. And this is a Republican-led House. And Republicans have an argument amongst themselves, particularly Ukraine, because this is primarily a Ukraine bill. Is funding Ukraine's continued defense against a Russian invasion in America's interest. That is the proposition we're going to be debating here today, among other things. And for these two perspectives, I'm going to start with Michael. Now, Michael, I'm, I'm the host. I'm not a moderator. I have views, and I'm not shy about expressing them. But we want to make sure that everybody gets a bite at this apple. Michael, is funding Ukraine's continued defense in America's interest? Uh, no, because the best outcome uh, we could possibly hope for in this in this path of funding their defense is actually making Ukraine a dependency of the West in perpetuity um, for as long as it takes to get back up on its feet. That means effectively we are joining ourselves to a political project which is massive in scope basically detaching Ukraine politically, economically, culturally from Russia's influence and integrating it into Europe, Europe's uh, sphere and into their institutions. Uh, this is a, a, a true aspiration on the part of many Ukrainian nationalists, and it's totally understandable why. It's definitely driven by the fact that Russia is an economic laggard and in some ways a cultural backwater Whereas Eastern European states like Poland have experienced 20 years of 4% growth or more. So I totally understand the aspiration of the Ukrainians to join Europe uh, and to seek a future in the West. However, their, their economy, their, their energy infrastructure, uh, and in fact, the Russia's own defense operations are tangled up in their territory and removing it is a hugely expensive project. This is peripheral to America's interests. It's in, in my view and in the view of many others, 
our prosperity does not and uh, depend on trade with Ukraine, although Ukraine contributes many wonderful things to the global economy. Um, our security is never dependent on who is in power in Kiev and is unlikely ever to do so. And so doing this project is expensive and treacherous for us, and it is easy for Vladimir Putin or another Russian leader to disrupt it, uh, whether to disrupt it just because the, literally they can walk across the border with an army, or to dis historically Russia's been able to exercise tremendous influence in Ukraine through political proxies, economic proxies, major companies, or through Ukraine's dependence on them for oil or other goods. So this is this is just a, a, a bigger bite than we can chew off, even if we succeed uh, in helping Ukraine free itself from uh, Russia's invasion. Uh, and of course, in the in the ultimate success, if if we pushed Russia back behind the February 2022 20, lines, we're faced with the question of what about Crimea? Ukraine says recovering Crimea is part of their uh, mission and their mandate uh, is part of uh, their definition of victory. Now, recovering Crimea would would probably mean at this point ejecting Russia from its naval base at Sevastopol. And of course, integrating Ukraine into NATO would, would require that as a matter of course. Russia has shown a willingness to fight great power wars throughout its history to maintain Black Sea access from which it protects itself from Turkey, Iran, or uh, other Western uh, powers that might in encroach in that space. So this is this is just this is us pushing beyond the limits of our power and into a space where I, I'm not. I will never assert that Russia has a right to Ukraine. It has a um, you know some kind of proprietary interest in Ukraine that belongs to it. I'm just stating as a matter of geography, economics, history, culture that it has and it does exert a tremendous influence there and has the ability to disrupt the westernizing project of Ukraine very easily. So this is, I think, a, a, a waste of resources. I think this, I think even Ukraine hawks themselves do not believe that the bill that passes that is before the Congress this week is sufficient to make a large military difference this year. It is almost half of what we sent last year it is not coming along with the enormous and now unrepeatable donation of military equipment that we helped organize from countries like South Korea last year before the counteroffensive. And Ukraine's army is more degraded. Uh, it's getting older. It's recruiting among an, an older population now. And the prospect and the Russian defenses are digging in deeper and deeper and becoming harder to object over time. So I, I, and I would put it to anyone who speaks next, what do they think this bill will accomplish that uh, militarily or politically that the previous bill did not accomplish for Ukraine? And that's just setting aside the other thing. I will say there are some good things in this bill. I appreciate and I support expanding America's defense production, particularly the uh, sections that are dedicated to upping our production of submarines. I think we have to go a lot further. And I think if we really want to improve America's defense production for America, we can't pair that with more defense commitments that drain almost the entirety of what we're committing to produce. All right, That's let's get just... Dominic in here. Dominic, to Michael's question, are we throwing good money after bad here? Moscow's not going away. Moscow won't disappear. They have more vested interests in this part of the world, I think even I would concede, than the United States, although our interests are permanent and immutable. Um, is he right? Why are we just throwing money at this, at this problem without any hope of actually effectuating a permanent solution that would advance American interests? Well, Moscow obviously isn't going anywhere. Um, and uh, it is certainly an expensive commitment on the part of the United States. Um, that shouldn't be minimized. That should not be. Uh, that should not be thrown away. Um, I also hope everybody who's watching this, you know, listened carefully to what Michael said because uh, he does not make uh, the dumb version of this argument. He makes a very, uh, a very reasoned and and thoughtful uh, version of the argument against um, against involvement in Ukraine. And I I respect that argument while still disagreeing with it. Um, I think 
what should probably be noted about this bill in particular um, is the parts that aren't being talked about as much, which are the parts that support Israel and the parts that support Taiwan. Oh, we will get to that. Uh, That's actually later on in this in this conversation. OK, stick OK, with sure, sure, sure. Um, but my point in bringing that up, though, is that, uh, as you mentioned in the opening, Noah, uh, this is a situation where we have a Republican controlled House of Representatives and a Democratic controlled Senate and a Democratic president. And so uh, any aid bill to anybody and any piece of legislation, period, is not going to have it's not going to be pleasing to everybody on, on, on the Republican side of the aisle uh, or the Democratic side of the aisle. And so there's a lot in this bill that people uh, in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party both disagree with. Uh, but I think that uh, I think it's still uh, more positive than negative and still is still worth getting through. Uh, again, for that aid to, to Israel and Taiwan, which, as far as I know, all Republicans are basically on the same page on. Uh, but then uh, on the issue of, of Ukraine, uh, as Michael brought up, uh, a lot of this money goes to replenishing um, uh, replenishing supplies that uh, Ukraine has already been using. Uh, those supplies are made by Americans in the United States, and it comes out to about 75 percent of the money being spent in this bill will never actually leave the United States. Um, I don't say that from the point of view of a person who believes that that's like good for the economy or something. That is that that's a fallacy. Uh, but I do say it from the point of view uh, that it is not true. The talking point that we've heard from a lot of politicians, uh, which is that this bill takes ninety five billion dollars from Americans and sends it all uh, to other parts of the world. Uh, that is not that is not the case. And so I think that's a really important thing to remember about this as well. Um, and uh, as far as uh, rebuilding defense production capacity. That is something that is, uh, you know, in my view, the United States has been under investing in, in defense in recent years. Uh, we are at a, a roughly 60 year low as a percentage of GDP in our defense budget. We spend about three and a half percent of GDP. Um, I would probably like to see that up around four or five percent, somewhere in there. Um, and uh, while this is not the defense budget, it is uh, a, a, a starting point to rebuild some of that capacity and get back to a position where the United States can more confidently produce uh, the weapons and supplies it needs to achieve its national security objectives. Yeah, this is where I invoke my host prerogatives to say, yes, this is absolutely in America's national interest, national security interest, not but throwing good money after bad, because we, first of all, the investment of national prestige is never throwing good money after bad. It is an investment in the geopolitical order that was established after 1945 and has served us particularly well. Ukraine is on the back foot in part because we have taken our foot off the gas. But you ain't seen nothing like the panic that would ensue in Europe if if Moscow were to advance uh, further deeper into into uh, Ukraine and perhaps threaten Kyiv again. Not just us who are on the line here, it's the entire NATO alliance. And while we in the West, in the United States and Western Europe and Canada in particular, can speculate and watch from abroad and view this as an academic subject. It's not the case in Romania and Poland and the Baltic states. And the prospect of, a, of an alliance structure that begins to come apart as the frontier allies start to have to worry about their own security and maybe take steps that are not in line with what Washington wants, what London wants, what Paris wants, introduces infinite more complexity to the conflict and far more opportunities for a conflagration that we can't control. Vladimir Putin has demonstrated in his very long and, uh, and helpful interview with Tucker Carlson, which was basically just a restatement of what he had said on Febu in February of 2022. He believes he has uh, deep historical uh, claims to not just parts of Ukraine, but parts of Eastern Poland, the Baltic states, areas that the very same Casas Belli that led to the Ukraine invasion could absolutely be invoked there. And so while the Ukraine cause is not going especially well now, the prospect of allowing that to deteriorate further, I think is, is one that we haven't really fully contemplated. And if it does, if Ukraine starts to look like it's about to buckle, I think you'll see a panic like we've never seen before. So if this gets passed now, or if it gets passed, some supplemental for Ukraine gets passed months and months from now, I do think it is inevitable. Um, Briefly, let's turn to the domestic politics of this. Obviously, Republicans are set against each other on the Ukraine aid, but Democrats are set against each other on the Israel aid. We haven't really discussed 
the internal politics on either side. President Biden needs this package. He has invested the credibility of his administration and the prestige of the United States in these conflicts abroad, in Israel's war against Hamas, in Ukraine's defense against a Russian invasion. Republicans have him up against the wall. They know that. They've tried to push their leverage to the extent that they can. Oddly enough, they sort of have let him go on the border stuff, but they still know that they have him up against a wall. But can Joe Biden flip the script? If this thing goes nowhere, if it stalls in the House indefinitely and is functionally dead, Michael, what happens to the Republican coalition when Joe Biden comes back and says, you, you say, okay, you sacrificed Ukraine, you sacrificed Israel, you don't actually mean any of the half the things you say. Does Joe Biden benefit from that? Does he get a boost from progressives? What are the politics if this deal simply goes down? Possible the deal could simply go down. I think Republicans would would very quickly, and, and some Republicans have already experimented with an Israel only bill and proposing that as an alternative. Uh, and again, that that is an issue where um, Republicans would be standing with perhaps eighty percent of Americans who support Israel, and um, they would be uniting their own conference in doing that, and potentially dividing Democrats. I mean, obviously Democrats want to get uh, Ukraine aid funding too. Um, I think some of them wanted to formalize some of the powers that were proposed in the original border compromise as well. Um, I think because it worked to their long-term advantage. Uh, but I, I, Republicans can pass an Israel only bill in the, in the house. Uh, they're, they're fully capable of doing that even with uh, Thomas Massey dissenting as I imagine he might. Um, they will get that across and I think many Democrats would join them. And um, so you would isolate the squad uh, and possibly allow Joe Biden to have a kind of sister soldier moment if he if he wanted to take it. Increasingly, it seems like he doesn't want to. Well, Michael, the, there was an attempt at an Israel only bill. The president threatened to veto it, but it didn't make it out of the House in part because Republicans balked at it, not because they don't support Israel or don't support Israel's cause but because they want offsets in, in terms of uh, the amount of money that we're spending in there. And, and there's the blue eye shades, or green eye shades calculation rather, ended up winning the argument. Well, it, it would, it, the this thing is, is that the politics of this are changing almost daily. As we saw this, this week, you know, Sunday night, there was still pressure on Republicans possibly to sign the border deal. And then it evaporated. If this deal isn't going to go anywhere in the house, I think first Mike Johnson will probably try to send something back to the Senate with border provisions and probably see that spiked before we get to the next stage of the of the debate. Um, I think he would be well advised. If, I mean, if I were advising the House, I would submit it to a normal amendment process. I actually think that would produce a healthier bill all around uh, and one that is actually generating political excitement and support in the legislature rather than what has been done traditionally and for for too long, which is having leadership craft these bills in one one House office or one Senate office and then try to cram it down. Um, give actual legislating a chance in this is my it would be my advice. Hey, Dominic, I think that there's little prospect for that in this particular case, just because and this is very perverse because I I fear le leadership thinks it'll pass. If it went through an amendment process, if it went through regular order, it would pass. It's a 70-30 proposition in the Senate. By all accounts, it's a 300 vote, 350 vote margin of support for it in the House. And there hasn't been a whip count or anything, but that just seems to be where the general state of affairs are here. I mean, you're the green eye shades guy. Dominic, for our audience who may not know, he's one of the he's he's an a hawk on budget matters, like you've never seen, and he knows his stuff. But when it comes to national security in Israel, I think, Dominic, you would say, and Ukraine, you would say that these are necessary expenditures. That doesn't seem to be the view of the Republicans on the Rules Committee who are very focused on budgetary matters. Do you agree with them? And importantly, back to the scenario where this bill doesn't go down, do Republicans risk their own enthusiasm making such a big deal out of Israel's cause and then leaving them in the lurch when it mattered. 
Yeah, would I like to see pay for us for it? Would I like to see the whole thing uh, compensated with spending cuts elsewhere? Absolutely, I would. Um, but, uh, you know, we've had uh, years and years and years now of Congress uh, spending without having those pay for us, without having those necessary cuts. Um, and to pick this as the moment uh, now where we're going to be really, really picky about that stuff, um, uh, about what is, you know, like I said, it's not an insignificant amount of money, but compared to a federal budget where last year we spent six trillion dollars, um, this is not this is not what's breaking the bank. And so um, uh, Brian Riedel of Manhattan Institute made a really good point on Twitter the other day. He said, you know, uh, people it, it's 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 commonly found in opinion polling that people believe that foreign aid is a much larger portion of the budget than it actually is. In reality, foreign aid comes out to about 1% of all government spending. And so uh, what Riedel said is, you know, the part of the reason that people believe that is that Congress will spend six months debating this kind of thing. Uh, but then what's actually breaking the bank, which is entitlement spending and interest, uh, that spending is mandatory spending. So it's on autopilot. Congress never votes on it. It just goes out according to a formula every single year. Um, and so it's not subject to any debate at all. And so... Uh, and, and, and that mandatory portion of the budget is more than two thirds of, of, of total spending in the United States. And so uh, uh, to pick, you know, to pick what is in the grand scheme of the budget, a relatively minor portion to be the spot where we're going to insist on pay fors or else um, is bad. And it doesn't help either that the pay fors that Republicans originally proposed for the Israel bill, uh, the standalone Israel bill they had, would not have even covered the uh the expenses they were they were sort of gimmicky what they were saying is that um uh is reducing um uh, uh reducing funding for the irs uh to pay for israel which again doesn't make a lot of sense uh from a budgetary standpoint why are those two things related why didn't we pick something else etc but also uh reducing that funding from the irs was funding that was supposed to be used to increase revenue uh by by going after people who aren't paying their taxes and so uh, it wasn't even clear that it would come out to being uh, uh, balanced on a budgetary on a, on, a, on a budgetary level. And so uh, for Republicans to uh, insist on having those those pay fors for that after being so unserious about it when it was just an Israel standalone, uh, it really doesn't help their credibility on this issue. And I think it would be much better to have a, a more consistent approach when we're actually making the budget um, to have uh, to have to make sure that we have pay fors. Uh, then now where this is a, a national security issue and it's quite frankly the sort of thing that we have a government to do uh, to protect the national security interests of the United States, that is something that I think should be worthwhile to spend the money on. Yeah, I'm going to answer my own question here about, you know, I agree with that, Dominic, 100 percent. But when it comes to voter enthusiasm on the Republican side, I think this is a, a, a shoot yourself in the foot moment like I haven't seen in a very long time. You have to be, if you're a Republican, and you're of a certain age, e.g. over 30, you've spent your adult life being told by your re elected representatives and those who you trust, who are conservative as well, along with you, that Russia is a threat to national security. And while, while Ukraine aid is a controversial proposition among Republicans, and it may even be a minority proposition among Republicans, the minority is not small. Polling suggests we're talking about, even if it's a minority proposition, at least a third of the Republican Party supports the Ukrainian cause, likely because they support hemming in, boxing in, containing an aggressive and expansionist Russia. Likewise, the Republican Party has said a lot of nice things about Israel, but when it's on the mattresses, when its back is against the wall after the worst terrorist attack the country has ever experienced, and it's expending defensive ordinance all over the place, and we just decline to refill it because the prospect is too politically toxic for the moment, just in service to weird situation in the in the house, you and you end up taking the side of the squad. I think you risk depressing and sapping the enthusiasm out of a significant number of Republican voters. Who knows how many that is? But we're coming up on an election, which is going to need every Republican and every Democrat to go to the polls because it's going to be very very tight, and these margins might matter. Let's tee up some uh, some questions here while I ask the final question, and we'll get to raise your hand if you want to talk to our guests or talk to me. Um, but before that, guys, both of you, and you can just jump in wherever you want. Is something, anything, going to get past?
before Election Day to support Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan. Dominic, what do you say? I sort of assume something would for at least one of those. Um, it is hard to uh, it is hard to say exactly what that would be, just given the uh, you know as you mentioned the politics on this are changing so rapidly, um, and the House majority is. I mean, it's 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 confusing sometimes who actually has the majority in the House. Uh, uh, with the uh, with the Republican majority as small as it is, uh, it only takes a, a couple of of Republican dissenters, and there are plenty of potential Republican dissenters uh, to prevent anything from passing on party line. And if the Speaker doesn't want to bring something to the floor that won't pass on party line, um, which you know in the past on spending bills he has. Uh, he has brought things to the floor that have passed with Republicans and Democrats uh, supporting it. Um, so, I mean, this is something that he's done before, so he could do it again. But as it stands right now, he doesn't seem like he wants to do that. And so uh, until that calculus changes, it will be very hard to pass something. But I do think that that calculus will change uh, over uh, over a little bit longer time when it becomes more evident that Israel needs help. I think Israel will probably be the one that 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 moves the needle on this for Republicans again because basically all of them agree on it, um, and uh, and in divided government it will probably end up being some kind of compromise that includes something for uh, for Ukraine as well. But we'll have to see what happens and uh, uh, and you know I, to to go back to what we were talking about earlier with the legislative process, it would be great to see just a regular legislative process on this. It would be great to see the regular legislative processes on everything Congress does. I think we should uh, get back to that as a country. Dominic is a yes pending catastrophe. Michael, where are you? I'm, I'm a yes. I'm basically with Dominic. I think Israel will drive uh, Republicans to unite around something uh, in the House. And, um, you know, that may include Ukraine spending. Again, I think there may be one more attempt at uh, uh, doing something about border uh, security spending. I know people are working on uh, various proposals, both on the Senate and the House side, to try to uh, patch something up together um, and not just let the issue die. Or worse, I mean, th there's the, the very real possibility that Joe Biden will try to take the issue away from Republicans simply by pressuring Mexico to stem the flow to such a degree that Biden takes all the credit for solving his own border crisis. Um, <laughs> and well, that 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 is that is something then Republicans he, would only have themselves to blame. They had him on the ropes and they just let him go. Well, I think that, I think many of them felt that the the bill that was produced had didn't close the the major loopholes they wanted closed didn't really compel biden to to uh prevent one more migrant than he wanted to from coming in uh, and pro provided too many loopholes to allow asylum officers to just grant basically residency and work permits uh in a sort of quasi substitute legal process so I think the, the 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 lack of trust is what uh, uh, drove that to to failure, and also many of the 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 headline extraordinary powers to quote shut down the border were set to expire for the next president anyway, right? you know, within a year, which looked like a kind of trap where Republicans were voting to constrain potentially the next Republican president uh, at the border. So it it that was. That was difficult. I know some Republican analysts, some senators felt it was a good deal that they shouldn't have turned down. Some are alleging that it's just being turned down for the politics of Donald Trump's advantage in fight with Joe Biden. But again, there are legislators who really want to get something done and they will they will try to put this deal back to some sort of deal back together and push it back before the Senate. And so we'll I don't see. know. Does that constitute hopeful from you? Because you don't want to see this pass. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm. <laughs> uh, I want, I want to see America invest in its industrial uh, uh, defense uh, industries, and um, I want to see a functioning Congress. I'm, fi I'm absolutely fine with um, giving Israel some aid uh, in its war, uh, although. 
there are questions longer term about how much meddling does Israel want from American uh, presidents at the cost of getting this aid and ordinance. I mean, it's just um, Joe Biden has been unbelievably overbearing in private to uh, the Israeli government. And Israel is not what it was, you know, what it was 30 years ago, where it desperately needed America's financial support and strong economy behind it. It has a strong economy. It has a roaring defense industry of its own. Um, and what it seems to need most of all is political independence to pursue uh, its goals without Joe Biden worrying about what the headlines say in Dublin and in Dubai. Yeah. I wish I was as sanguine as either of you about the prospects for this bill, but my suspicion is that nothing gets passed before Election Day, because I don't think any of this has anything to do with foreign conflicts. I don't think it has to do with the border. I don't think it has to do with Israel. I don't think it has to do with Ukraine. I think it's all domestic politics. The reason why this stalled out is because of the makeup of the House presently and the political dynamic domestically. And anything that gets through the House, I think, would have to get through the House with Democratic votes. And that's the end of Mike Johnson's speakership. And he does not seem so far inclined to throw himself on the pyre in defense of any of these issues. And that's what it would take. It would take self-sacrifice, or at least a willingness to put himself up for uh, his own party's rebuke. And I've not seen that kind of courage. So my suspicion is, barring perhaps barring a catastrophe, as Dominic said, something that really resets the entire debate, I don't think this is going anywhere. Let's see if we can take some hands do we have anybody who wants to chime in? No, nothing yet? All right. Well, if you guys want to chime in later, I'll let you know. Move on briefly to, if you guys have time, I want to talk a little bit about domestic politics insofar as we got some election results. Off though they were, weird district though they were, weird circumstances in the special election though they were, it's not often that we have actual votes to parse and discuss ahead of the 2024 presidential election. So New York 03, George Santos' former district, George Santos ejected by his fellow members of Congress, the race to replace him. Tuesday night, uh, Tom Suozzi, former Dem Democratic rep, moderate Democratic rep, emerged victorious, outperformed his polls. It's kind of hard to say what the polls are accurate, but he got about eight points. It wasn't really a very close race, even though it was low turnout. But everybody's taking signals from this. You can't help it. It's the only, the only evidence we have of what works and what doesn't. Tom Suozzi ran a race in which he distanced himself from Joe Biden. He uh, was critical of Joe Biden on uh, his border policies. He was very gung-ho about Israel. All the progressives who were lobbying against Israel's cause, he told them to go take a hike. And he was rewarded for it in this suburban district in Queens and Nassau County, Long Island. Um, there's a temptation always to overread special election results, and then the people who overread special election results are chided by the people who say don't overread special election results. But we don't have to focus entirely on New York 3 to discern at least one trend here across special elections, across the midterms, across the off years and runoffs. We've had now two years at least to demonstrate that Democrats have a small but dedicated base of voters who turn out for every race. And they've demonstrated a capacity to throw those races towards Democrats. That's a big shift in the coalitions. The coalition's dynamic used to favor Republicans in small turnout elections and off years and special elections because those voters were better educated, affluent, suburban. They leaned right. They weren't culturally right. They were fiscally right. But they were stakeholders and absolutely plugged in to the political scene because they, this, were, this isn't a hobby for them. They, they have expectations for the political class and they mean it and they want to see it through. And it looks like they've shifted over to Democrats, at least for the time being, in a way that has significantly advantaged Democrats and their election prospects. Dominic, the question now before everybody is, does this translate to presidential politics? Because Republicans will tell you, at least uh, Republicans who buy into the theory, will tell you that, yeah, we've traded some of these voters in, this, in, in that fringe of the coalition, and yeah, when in small margin races, it can, it can matter for Democrats. But ultimately, they flood the zone in presidential years. These voters may not be super plugged in 
to these small races. But when it comes time to vote in a presidential, they're there, and they're there hard. Does that mean that all these Democrats, Democratic voters who turn out for these small races, these odd races and off years, does that mean Joe Biden's the exception to the rule? That all these Democrats favor Democratic candidates, but not Joe Biden? It's tricky for Republicans when they're looking at this because uh, the Republican House majority that barely exists right now, it only exists because of New York State. Uh, New York is a blue state, but uh, it was a bunch of very close House races uh, that, that Republicans won in New York. Uh, that ended up giving them the majority. A lot of that came from uh, Lee Zeldin's exceptionally strong run uh, as the Republican nominee for governor there. He overperformed uh, a lot of recent Republican uh, nominees in the, in the election against against Kathy Hochul. And uh, that probably, you know, even though he lost, that was able to pull up a lot of, you know, he lost statewide, but that was able to pull up a lot of House candidates in specific districts who ended up uh, defeating Democrats in close elections. And so uh, for Republicans looking at this special election, that was one of those very close races that they won last time, and it's one that they've now lost. Um, so, uh, so so that 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 should be that should be a warning sign, uh, a warning sign for Republicans, even though, as you say, it is a low turnout special election, so we probably shouldn't make too much out of it. But uh, that is something uh, that Republicans absolutely should keep in mind. Michael, I saw CNN correspondents on the ground in New York 3 saying, we talked to voters, and a lot of them are saying, you know, they were particularly moved by the fact that Republicans uh, balked at this bipartisan compromise bill, which tells you exactly what kind of voter you're dealing with. Not an average voter. Very unusual voter who pays attention to every news cycle and is animated to register their dissatisfaction with the news cycle as it's happening. That does not describe the average voter in a presidential election, a general presidential election. But I don't necessarily want to dismiss the point outright, because does the GOP open itself up to the charge that it can't govern in a meaningful way that either enthuses Democratic voters in a general election or depresses their own turnout? I just don't, I can't say that, that there's no meat on those bones even if the people turning out in this particular race are unrepresentative of what the broader national electorate is going to be? No, it, it is a tricky question. Um, what, what, we've, what I've seen is that, uh, you know, there's been talk of educated voters drifting out of the Republican Party since the 1994 Gingrich Revolution. Um, you know, Bill Clinton won uh, high non-college voters by, I think, 14 points. And then that flipped in the Obama years, where Obama was winning college-educated voters by almost 14 points. And um, so this is a trend that's been uh, waxing and waning a, a little bit uh, each year. Now, what we find, however, is that Trump highly motivates a certain kind of anti-Trump voter uh, and can motivate that person in off-year elections. But Trump doesn't uh, motivate Trumpy voters when Trump isn't on the ballot, right? So you see these results where Republicans totally get wiped out in Pennsylvania when the Trumpy candidates are like Doug Mastriano um, and, or in New Hampshire, Doug Balduck, something like that, where and Trump's not on the ballot himself. Uh, those candidates, you know, they don't have their names on hotel uh complexes or golf courses around the world they just don't excite voters but they they do seem to excite the opposition but meanwhile when trump is on the ballot you sometimes get these crazy results like you had in maine's senate election where susan collins who many people thought would lose has her greatest victory ever because her coalition of republican voters turned out and um voted for her and then Trump's coalition of voters showed up for him and then also voted for her down the ballot. So, you know, we may see Trump argue in the future uh, uh, after uh, the 2020 elect 2024 election that he's a help to some Republicans again. But basically that I, I think that's going to be because he's a help when he brings his positives, but his negatives are clinging to the party year in and year out. Um uh, and he can't, uh, you know, so you you either 
have all of Trump and you get some positive, uh, you know, you get a, a deeper turnout in rural areas than normal, or you don't have Trump and you get, you still get the high elevated anti-Trump democratic turnout in the suburbs. Um, it's it's going to be a difficult thing for Republicans and Republicans don't have the tools that Democrats had to organize non-college voters in the 20th century, like, you know, labor unions or things like that, that would organize democratic constituencies um, that didn't have college education and, and try to get them to vote. Republicans would have to find some kind of alternative route of reaching those voters. Unfortunately, those voters tend to be the most deinstitutionalized people in America, the, the people who do, do the least amount of civic engagement. They're not in the Elks. They're not in um, you know, other civic societies. They're not going to church even. Uh, which would have, you know, you thought been a more natural uh, way to approach them. So this it's a riddle for Republicans. And I think it's going to take a few more election cycles for us to really parse out this trend and how much Trump's brand sticks to the party uh, in the future. Yeah, and it seems like for Democrats, their primary GOTV channel is Donald Trump and his presence on the ballot, or at least his presence on their television screens. Um, yeah. So since the, the end of this, or rather since the, the compromise bill failed, Republicans in the Senate have been, and in the House, have been reading the stage directions in ways I, I haven't seen previously. So this bill comes up and Mitch McConnell says reportedly, I think according to Punchbowl, well, our leader doesn't like it. What can you do? It's over. Our leader being the likely presidential nominee, Donald Trump. Lindsey Graham says, well, we should change this into a loan because that's what Donald Trump wants. I'm literally just saying, we're going to do what Donald Trump wants. He's, he's the guy, right? We got to do it. So the Republican Party in Congress has functionally become an extension of Donald Trump. They're admitting it. They're doing, they're doing everything they can to say this is a one-man show, which makes it very difficult to distance yourself from the nominee. It'll help in certain states and certain districts. won't help in other states and other districts, which is where my question goes particularly on the senatorial level, Republicans in 2023 began recruiting some pretty good candidates to Senate seats, some competitive, some less so. But you have candidates now, for example, Maryland's former Governor Larry Hogan, Dave McCormick in Pennsylvania, perhaps even Michigan, where these candidates don't necessarily have a Trumpy brand. In fact, they've done their utmost to distance themselves from the former president previously. It's not clear that Donald Trump would allow that to happen. But even if he did, if he was so inclined, if he was coached to say, yeah, they can, they can push themselves away from, from me if that's how they need to run their race. He's never demonstrated an inclination to do that. Even in New York 3, where he said the only reason why Maisie Pillip, who's the Republican who lost, lost, was because she didn't sidle up to Donald Trump in a district that he lost in 2020. It would have been stupid politics. But he nevertheless says, that's why you lose. When you lose, it's because you didn't embrace Donald Trump. When you win, it's all Donald Trump. Will, will the former president, current nominee, most likely nominee, allow people like McCormick and Hogan to run their own races? Is it even possible to run your own race in an environment where you've got Congress saying, listen, he's the guy, he calls the shots, we do what he say, up or down referendum on Donald Trump, Dominic? It's not just Republicans that have this problem, Noah, it's Democrats too. Um, we got to remember as recently as 2014, there were Democratic senators from Arkansas, Louisiana, North Dakota, Indiana. These are all places that you couldn't even imagine a Republican winning now. That was only, or excuse me, a Democrat winning now. That was only 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, the Democratic Party of Harry Reid was much better at allowing, uh, at allowing uh, candidates to do this, run campaigns that are specific to their state, um, and and it didn't seem to hurt Democrats when they got to Washington because they got to Washington, and they all voted in lockstep anyway. Um, and so I, I think we'll see, you know, I, I think that that model of politics is something that we should that, that both Republicans and Democrats should should be should be going back to, which is to say, hey, do what you have to do to win in your state, especially for Senate elections, because it's a statewide election. Um, they're not being elected to represent the entire country. They're being elected to represent their state. And um, Republicans in New York, for example, are different than Republicans in, in, in Tennessee or in Alabama. And uh, we shouldn't expect them to be uh, we shouldn't expect them to campaign to talk the same way on the campaign trail. Um, so I, I really hope that Republicans get that. And 
uh, one of the points too, uh, Michael was talking about how you know uh, Trump uh, uh, Trump's presence on the ballot can help Republican candidates, and, and you know it, it definitely can in some places. But to go back to the example of New York in 2022, Lee Zeldin way outperformed Donald Trump, uh, even in counties in the rural counties in, in that are supposed to be Trump's uh, bread and butter. He outperformed Donald Trump by anywhere between seven and twelve percentage points in a lot of those in a lot of those counties in upstate rural New York. So the idea that Trump has some magic touch with rural voters, I don't think is right either. Um, a, a lot of Republicans who uh, and it's a similar story, by the way, with Glenn Youngkin in, in Virginia. He, he did better in a lot of rural counties than, than, than Donald Trump did. And so uh, uh, this this Republican model of politics that says, oh, we'll run up the score in the rural areas with Trump and we'll compensate for losing the suburbs and other areas. Uh, with that bigger margin, I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's the right way to look at it either. That's really interesting, Michael. I don't know if we still have you. Um, oh, I'm I'm here. Okay, I you think... just lost your camera. Um, is that what what Dominic is saying? So to put this in terms of uh, a cable news host, for example, has the Republican Party experienced something like audience capture? Because if Dominic is saying the numbers don't make sense that you've got evidence to suggest that you can distance yourself from Donald Trump and cleverly, perhaps not necessarily in a ham fisted way that would appeal to the MSNBC viewer, but would necessarily allow you to navigate a thorny environment. Um, have, and Republicans don't seem to have many much sense, uh, institutional memory rather about how to run those sorts of races. So is the GOP just married to the idea that it's the Trump base or nothing? Uh, I mean, it is tough. I mean, it, you you saw in the you know in the two thousands, the it was kind of the last gasp of like northeastern Republicans, where you had like congressmen like Chris Shays hanging on in Greenwich, you know, very like pro finance friendly Republican, was replaced by a, a finance friendly Democrat, you know, in Jim Himes or someone like that. Um, it's possible. It's still possible to do this, and I think actually Larry Hogan is a politician who has uh, a very strong brand in his state. And you see other politicians- you know, He's gonna pick fights. He, he, he picks fight and that's, well, that's With how you his build. own party. I mean, that's a risky that's proposition. How, it's how, but that's how you build the, these independent brands that work where you can get, um, uh, you know, a Democrat elected in West Virginia or uh, Kirsten Cinema can kind of become, um, you know, maverick, branded candidate of normal people in Arizona, right? Uh, where, and allow the Republican party to define itself by its base and by its extremes. Um, so I, I think Hogan, Hogan has the capability to do this, but it is risky and it is hard to do it because you have to survive that first pass through in the primaries where, you know, you, you, you typically have to run the gauntlet of the most, committed, most ideologically um, uh, motivated Republican voters who slap down those moderates and who slap down progressives like that. Um, so it's, it's, it is a little difficult, but again, this is a kind of institutional choice of how the Republican party and how the Democratic party run themselves now, which is like, we start out in these very tiny Democratic contests that give outsized power to, to, uh, the most ideologically um, uh, strident faction of the party. Um, it's not necessarily a, a, a way to win elections. And that's why you have this kind of, um, you know, contest in American politics for the normal voter. This, there's a kind of hidden uh, contest in politics. You saw it in the the win for Glenn Youngkin in, in Virginia, which is, I'm going to appeal aggressively to normal people, people who have kids in schools, who want a better life for themselves and who are thinking about bread and butter issues rather than, you know, what you saw, you know, uh, MAGA base candidates who are like talking about, um, you know, conspiracies and mail ballot fraud or whatever that most voters don't care about and don't think relates to their daily lives at all. And it's important to remember, too, that young kid in Virginia did not have to win a primary. He was nominated in a nominated convention run by the Republican Party of Virginia. Uh, I think I'd like to see more states do things like that. Yeah, that's complicated, though, when you have a state that does that sort of thing so they can bypass their own voters and install candidates 
could they prefer to be more loyal to, uh, for example, Donald Trump, among others? Uh, so it's a complicated situation there. All right, so let me get your final bets, because the parties have made some very big bets. The idea here is that, yeah, Republicans sacrificed a lot of those high propensity voters, but they get a giant chunk of low propensity voters who will turn out for Republicans, probably just Donald Trump, but well, that's a problem for another day. They turn out for Donald Trump in the presidential election. Is that sufficient? I mean, obviously, I'm not asking you to predict the election, but is that sufficient to overcome this narrow, dedicated base of Democratic voters? Does it rest entirely on enthusiasm, or is the dynamic of this campaign a little bit more dynamic based on events? Michael. It's very tough um, to say. I mean, I just Certainly think too far out because the events could intervene and you have no we, idea what they are by definition, but you can absolutely not, count on it engaged voters being more on the Democratic side than the Republican side. Listen, if you are a betting person, I think the smart bet is to bet on Democrats. They have not only outperformed um, in the election, they, they've outperformed the polls going into every election now, um, uh, back to 2018. Um, so, you know, you, people were predicting a red wave and we did, we got like a little trickle in New York that was just purely an accident of how greedy New York Democrats were in a redistricting process that got thrown out by the courts. So, um, again, I, you also... You know, Joe Biden has, is terribly unpopular, but, uh, you know, he also won the most votes in history of a presidential candidate because he was running against Donald Trump and the willingness to turn out against him was just so high. Now, some of that was people voting to turn the page on COVID. They thought the only way to do so was to get Trump out of office. That's no longer a factor. Booing uh, Biden, that kind of desperation for change that i think many people felt in late 2020 but um yeah i would i would bet on the civic and the engaged and people rooted in their communities who turn out frequently uh, over the over the rest who are depending on their passions and also people who distrust the system right people who think maybe their vote won't count even if they show up or or and they won't participate in some of the more liberal um, voting practices we've instituted, like mail-in voting or early voting. Yeah, that sounds like a very unreliable voter. Dominic, GOP's big bet, brand new coalition. Good bet, stupid bet. It doesn't seem like a great bet to me, Noah. <laughs> uh, I think the, um, you know, we, it was strange that the GOP seemed to make this bet uh, after 2014, when in 2014, the Republican Party controlled I believe 33 governorships. Uh, they controlled both houses of Congress. They controlled uh, basically everything except the presidency. It was a complete uh, demolition for Democrats uh, during the eight years of Barack Obama at the state level and, uh, and then in Congress as well, and especially uh, later on. And so uh, this this mindset that came in of, oh, Republicans never win. They, we need to do, we need to change everything. We need to do everything completely differently. And they've fared much worse since that decision was made. Uh, that, you know, that Republicans do not control nearly as many governorships today. They do not control, uh, you know, they, as we can see, even if they do have a majority in the House, they can barely control their own majority. So um, I, I think the Republican Party across the board is a much worse run organization from the perspective of what parties are supposed to do, which is win elections. That's what parties are for. They're not for um, they're not for other things uh, necessarily. So um, so I, I think uh, so I think that's an important thing to 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 keep in mind um, when 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 thinking about this. Uh, I also think that, uh, you know, you're trading these uh, higher propensity voters for for more lower propensity voters, I just don't see that payoff uh, working out all the time, especially with Donald Trump being the one who's in charge of it. Um, I, I just, his, um, uh, not only did Joe Biden win the most votes of any presidential candidate last time in 2020, he also raised more money than any presidential candidate has ever raised. Uh, during this, uh, a couple of weeks ago, when, when the um, uh, special counsel's report came out about Biden's memory and how 
his mental state isn't totally there. There was a lot of talk about, well, are Democrats going to try to replace him? But during that same week, Joe Biden was attending fundraisers in New York City where he was raising millions of dollars. He still has that backing uh, from within uh, the party, from within uh, the, the infrastructure of, of, of uh, the progressive movement, uh, which is still raising tons of money for him and, and, and doing that sort of thing. Now, obviously, raising the most money doesn't win elections necessarily. You can ask Michael Bloomberg about that. But it is an indication of the confidence that the uh, that the infrastructure of the progressive movement feels in uh, the continued uh, candidacy of Joe Biden. And so if he comes into Election Day uh, running against Donald Trump uh, with, you know, goodness knows what is going to happen in any of his court cases or any of the rest of that, that's going to freak out normal voters who, by the way, aren't even paying attention to the election right now. Um, you know, it might seem weird to people like us that obsess over this stuff, but a lot of voters have not even have not even really been thinking super hard about the election yet. They'll make up their mind sometime in October or November. And so, uh, you know, as all that information comes out, uh, especially with people who do not strongly identify with either party, again, the, the plurality of Americans are, are independents. Uh, this is something that it's going to be an uphill climb for, for Donald Trump. It uh, doesn't mean he can't do it, but uh, it's definitely, I would say, advantage Biden, even though he's uh, so uh, incredibly unpopular. Yeah, Dominic, you raise a good point about the, the criminal trials, because if you follow this granularly, you've learned this week, or at least last week and this week, that Donald Trump's most likely to go to court in March for the case brought by Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg against Donald Trump, which you're following very closely, you know is the weakest of all the cases. It's predicated on this very bizarre conception of where the jurisdiction is and how to prosecute this thing. And then he was going to prosecute and not prosecute it. So if you're following this, you think that's the weakest of all the cases. But if you're not following it closely, you see Donald Trump on the stand on trial for hush money payments and inflating the values of his businesses in or, or rather in, in, in trying to defraud investigators. And that's just not a good look. And if that's all you know about the thing, maybe that it falls in a weird direction. I'm gonna answer my own question briefly and say that that was a trick question for both of you. It's not a big bet at all. They didn't bet anything. This is a post hoc rationalization. They found themselves uh, on, on the other side of 2016 with a brand new coalition of voters and had to make the most of it. They didn't engineer this thing. I think if Republicans could have their, their choice they would snap their fingers and go back to a status quo ante in which they could count on voters in off-year elections and count on them to, to give them state-level and congressional majorities and maybe risk it in presidential years. But they do not have that luxury. Uh, thank you both for your time. I sincerely appreciate it. Before you go, I want you to tell our audience where they can find you and something that you've been working on for National Review that they can go read right now. Uh, Michael, why don't you start, bro? Sure. Well, you can find me at uh, National Review. Um, that is uh, where uh, I, I've been writing now for seven years, uh, actually, which is a shock to me. And uh, right now I'm working on a, a book review that will be coming up pretty soon of on uh, John Gray's new uh, essays about the passing of the liberal order. It's uh, uh, something I'm, I'm proud to be engaging with. And uh, I'll be proud to share with you all soon. And you should go to National Review and read um, what are about contrarian takes, let's put it that way, when it comes to Ukraine and, and Israel, because a lot of us are national security hawks, extroverted on the world stage. And we have uh, we have intense intellectual disagreements. Good natured, sure. good natured. But I'm, they're pretty conventional, I'm pretty conventional on Israel uh, these days. Um, again, I... I that may change if Israel if if it threatened to drag the U.S. into a major uh, war across the Middle East again. But I don't think Israel wants that to happen, um, and so I'm happy to support a friendly nation that is defending itself um, mostly on its own dime. We didn't even get a chance to talk about Taiwan, which was an <laughs> oversight, unfortunately, on our parts. Dominic, where can our audience find you, and what are you working on? Oh, social media. Well, I'm sorry. Been... I'm, I'm interrupting you, uh, Dominic. I apologize. But Michael, did you say where your social media is? Oh, just uh, Twitter, Michael BD, um, or x.com, Michael BD. Uh, other than that, um, you know, it, you, I try not to be found. Don't go anywhere else. Twitter is the only place. Every other place is a cesspit. Dominic, <laughs> 
Where can we find you? Well, I'm I'm on that I'm on that website as well uh, at Dominic J Pino. Um, you could find me there. Uh, tweet out all my pieces there. Uh, I had a piece today about um, uh, Tucker Carlson's uh, video from a Russian grocery store um, and uh, some of the issues uh, that were going on there. Um, and then uh, I just started a new podcast with the American Institute for Economic Research called Econception. Um, you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, anywhere you get podcasts. Uh, please subscribe. Uh, we just had the first episode come out today. We talked about the national debt and a couple of other issues as well. Um, it'll be, a, you know, try to keep it a fast podcast. This isn't going to be one of those hours long uh, slogs to get through. We're going to uh, cover cover issues quickly and, and hopefully uh, be able to relate economic principles to the issues uh, of the day. Dominic, I want to ask you, because I heard Riedel on, uh, I think it was Jonah Goldberg's podcast, where he said, how, is, how could you possibly keep talking about this in the same way, but somehow make it fresh? When you're talking about the the, the debt crisis, the entitlement crisis, it's this earthbound meteor the trajectory is not changing. It's just getting closer in the mirror. But how how do you keep saying the same thing over and over again and keeping it entertaining for an audience? That's your challenge, an Iconocast. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's very similar to the 2024 election in that sense. That's true enough. That's that's a grim uh, uh, prediction <laughs> for, our, for our collective futures. Um, that's going to do it for us. Thank you so much for joining us on the inaugural episode of Issues with Noah Rothman on Two Way. I'm Noah Rothman. I also write for National Review as a senior writer. Uh, you can check out my stuff over there. I wrote today about uh, a uh, upcoming Florida education law that would teach about the history of communism in perhaps ways that are critical, um, which is not hard to do. Uh, the history of communism is a tapestry of human misery. But there are quite a few Floridians who object to the idea that we might teach this one-sided version of history and we should perhaps teach about communism's uh, profound impact on weight loss and a variety of other ways in which it has uh, made everyone more miserable. You can find me at National Review. You can find me on Twitter. The handle is Noah P. Rothman. Thank you all so much for joining us. And I hope to see you again next time, Thursday, 5 p.m., right here. We'll see you then.